All right, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So again, I titled this morning's message, Follow the Leader. Uh, meaning, if you can kind of look at this message, at this particular scripture right here, it's describing the fact that you can walk after one or the other. I guess that, you know, I'm not trying to make anybody feel uncomfortable. I know that Angie, she just really doesn't care. She'll call you up here. And it really works good whenever you have that type of illustration. But for sake of better, let's just not do that. Let's just not make everybody feel weird. Let's just pretend, though, that I had two people up here, right? And one represented the spirit and the other represented the flesh. Now, when we talk about the flesh, what we need to understand is, is that many times we think of flesh in the sense of all my sinful activity, all my sinful desires. But what we really need to understand about the flesh, and this is a very abstract thought, but we're all smart enough and we, we, can, we can work through this, that the flesh really describes the, the person, the, the, the man, but in his fallen nature and all the intricacies of who he is in his fallen nature and the desires that he has. Yes, some of them are very sinful and some of them are things that will destroy our lives, but some of them just have to do with what we want to do, right? right? right. Our own will. That's really the majority of what my message is about this morning. Our own will and God's will. So the spirit is here. That's God's will. And the flesh is here. That's my will. And the part of my will many times that is contrary to yeah. his will. So we got two different people up here, the spirit and the flesh. And the question is, who are we going to follow after? And so the spirit takes off and he's going on a journey, right? Because the Holy Spirit's are going upon the land. He's going to and, to and fro, just, but so is the enemy. Going to and fro. And the question is, who will I follow? If the Spirit's going this way, will I follow after Him? If the flesh, Matt's flesh, is going, no, 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 I want to deviate from what the Spirit wants, and He's going this way, will I follow after Him? So, follow the leader, but who will be the leader in our life? Amen. So, we can either follow, once again, the Spirit or the flesh. And, once again, many times we think of the flesh as obviously sinful ways, the things that we aren't supposed to do. So I went ahead and listed some of them. Drugs and drinking and sexual promiscuity or even lustfulness connected to pornography or something else that we know would be sin, right? You got to be careful once you get saved and the Holy Spirit does live in you, right? And you start to purposefully move away from certain sinful activities. Can I get an amen in the house that we know that we're not supposed to live in blatant sin anymore whenever once we become Christians but if we're all honest with one another we've all fallen short of the glory of God even after we've been Christians but we're so fast to judge other people when they're not where we are oh holy brother holy sister I don't do what they do anymore and, and all of this kind of stuff like that you know pick your poison well believe me brothers and sisters you still got something on the inside of you that God needs to work out and if we're all honest with one another we should have a desire to want to see our brothers and sisters in the Lord liberated delivered and set free not like wanting to not like wanting to uncover their mess not like wanting to expose their mess because believe me, do you want all your mess exposed? No, of course you don't. You want the Lord to, to take care of you and to cover it and to heal it. But you know what? The, the best way to have that done is at least start coming clean with him. Amen. At least start coming clean with him and letting him know how and bear your heart to him. Lord, I don't want this thing in my heart. I don't want this thing in my life. I know by now I can't free myself of it in my own strength. Every little plan that I try, yeah, yeah. it's not working. Amen. You know, when she was singing that song there at the end, I start. I got this visual, and you know, I might have shared it with you before. I can't remember, but there's power in the name of Jesus. Amen. There is power in the name of Jesus. Listen, <clears throat> as your pastor, <clears throat> you all know how like. Sometimes I'm overly technical. My brain just that, and I I don't want to apologize, but I, 
you know. Anyway, that's how my brain works. But sometimes there's things that happen with God that you just can't explain. And it's hard for the preacher, hallelujah, to recognize that too, right? Sometimes there's just things that happen with God that you can't explain, man. Sometimes you just say the name of Jesus and boom, all kind of deliverance and freedom and liberty starts taking place. There was a story, and whatever you think about the Brownsville Revival, that's not what I'm here to do right now. But I will tell you this. I went to the Brownsville Revival, and I know one thing. The man that was preaching at that day was saying some good stuff. Well, his name was Steve Hill. He was an evangelist. And he was a heroin addict. When, before he got saved, he was a heroin addict. I'm talking about shooting heroin in his veins. All right? And they would be out on the streets, and then there was like this area where they would offer free food. But in order to get the food, you had to hear the gospel being preached. And there was one night that he actually turned to one of his friends, and he said, okay, which one of us is getting saved tonight? Because basically what they were saying is, is that we know the drill. We got to go listen to the message. And one of us needs to at least go up there and act like we're going to get saved so that we can get some food. <laughs> and they were, you know, sometimes whenever your drugs run out, you're hungry, right? I mean, I don't know. I know none of y'all don't know nothing about no drugs like that. But, you know, as long as you got your drug, you, you, that'd be your food. But when you run out, you're probably going to get hungry at some point in time. And so they needed some physical food. So one of us needs to get saved tonight. Well, it just so <laughs> happened, if I'm not mistaken, the way the story goes, that it was his night to go up and get saved. And so they listened to the message and he went up to the front and he went through all the motions and he got his little physical food and then he's sitting in his little one one room apartment and he has nothing there but an empty soul and a bunch of empty syringes with needles on the ends of it in his room and he's sitting there and he's like supposedly like from what I remember the story like throwing them up and sticking them in the ceiling mm -hmm. and so he's got these needles that he's throwing up and sticking them in the ceiling and then all of a sudden he just starts to say Jesus mm -hmm. Jesus Wow. Jesus. Oh, I feel it right now. Yes. Jesus. Jesus. And as he began to say Jesus repeatedly, because you see, the Lord knows. The Lord knows your journey, and he knows where you've been, and he knows where you've gone, and he knows how many times you've rejected and how many times you failed you. And while even though the preacher doesn't want to do it, I might look down on you if you fall again. The Lord loves you, and he's not going to let you down. He loves you so much that he died on the cross to set you free from your sin. And when he hears the change in the tone of your voice, I'm just saying it like that, it's really the change that's in your heart and the way that it's verbalized. The Lord knows. You have ain't playing games with him. Yeah, you might play games with the preacher and go up there and give your fake salvation so you can get your free plate of food, but you're not playing games with the Lord, but as soon as he sees that you've come to the place where the switch is flipped and that you're broken on the inside of your heart and you say that name differently, oh, at that point in time, everything changes. There's power in the name of Jesus, and the Lord floods in, and a creative miracle takes place, and I'm telling you right now, Amen. that brother was a preacher. Amen. That brother was a preacher of the gospel. God used that man to preach the gospel. Hallelujah. And listen to me, though. We got to follow the lead of one or the other. We're either following our flesh or we are following the spirit. Amen. See, what the Lord wants me to explain to you today is a little deeper than just the obvious blatant sins that are out there that we know that we shouldn't be living. We all know that we ought not be doing them things, right? Because not only will they destroy our walk with God, but they'll destroy everything. They'll destroy our health. They'll destroy our finances. They'll destroy everything. But what the Lord wants me to explain is deeper than that. God wants us to be aware that the following of the flesh versus the spirit is a battle of the will every day of your life. And in every decision that we make, there is an opportunity to follow the leader, either our will or God's will. Galatians 5 and 17, while he's turning there, I'm going to grab my water. Galatians 5 and 17 says that the flesh lusts against the spirit. And the spirit against the flesh. And that the two of them, the flesh and the spirit, are contrary to one another so that you cannot do the things that you would. So this word lust there, it's really a, another way you could say desire. But basically what the context of the scripture is, is that there is a battle that's ensuing. Mm -hmm. 
even after you're saved. I tried to talk to the, a preacher one time about this. He's like, I don't, well, it's in the scripture. <laughs> even after you're saved, there can be a battle that rages between your flesh and and the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is saying, this is what I want from you, and you know it, and in there's a part to you, if you're saved, we're about to get to that in a second too, because if you ain't saved, you ain't even got the battle, my friend. Right, right. Yeah. You might be miserable about where you are, but you don't have the spiritual battle that's ensuing in your heart, but even after you're saved, there can be a literal battle taking place on the inside of you between your flesh, what you want, and what the Spirit of God wants, and the two of them are contrary to one another, and if you're giving in to the flesh, guess what? You cannot do what you would. What would you do? I would do the will of God if I had the strength to do the will of God because I have been born again of God and the Spirit of God lives in me and the Spirit of God shows me through His Word what His will is for my life and as a child of God with the down payment and the earnest of the Holy Ghost that tells me that God is real I would walk with Him and live for Him if I only could. But I'm in the midst of a battle. In order to lay a foundation for a simple thought, I'm going to bring out some more complex points here. We might go from preaching to teaching. Just bear with me. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. It says the word of God is quick. That's an old King James word for alive. The word of God is alive. Did you know that? Yeah. It's not just black and red words on a white page. Hallelujah. Those words contain very life in them. For the word of God is alive and it's powerful and it's sharper than a two-edged sword and it pierces. It, it, another idea could be even cuts. It can cut to the point where it divides asunder. Almost like if you had two pieces of paper and you cut them. They were now, what was previously one is now two. It divides asunder the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Listen, working backwards, the word of God, when you get into the word of God, if you allow it to have its way, it will discern to you. It will reveal to you your own thoughts and the all your own intents of your heart the word of god through the holy ghost will bring chastisement and correction to your own heart but listen to me i don't know if it's if you're anything like me sometimes i don't want to hear what the lord's saying when the lord rebukes me in my spirit hallelujah i know when he's rebuking me he's saying son you're wrong right there and you know what the best thing to do Whenever you know the Lord's rebuking you or chastising you, is to surrender yes. to His will. Lord, help us to be do a better job yes. of surrendering yes. to Your will. Amen. Yes. But look at this. I want to see joints and marrow. Do you know that a marrow and a bone are one unit? I talked about this at the little men's breakfast that we had yesterday. That was pretty successful, I think. I thought it went real well. Uh, but anyway, bone and marrow. Make up one unit. They're two separate entities, but really they're one. The bone and the marrow are two. And really you don't have a proper functioning unit if you don't have both of them. The soul and the spirit. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw you a picture. The soul and the spirit. That's, that's the human, right, of what we can see. But there's a part on the inside of him that you and I can't see. Right. And we're going to just call this outer... I'm not trying to get all weird on you. Just work with me here, okay? We can call this outer part the soul, and we can call this inner part the spirit, all right? And what I want you to know is that just as bone and marrow equal one unit, the soul and the spirit equal one unit too. What is it equal? It equals, well, let me just put it like this. That looks like I'm, right? The inner man. It equals the inner man. All right. And so we'll just hold off on that for a second. But I want you to see that the soul and the spirit are intricately tied to one another and they equal your inner man. Lauren Larson said it like this, and I thought it was really good, that a wheel exists of two parts, a tire, the rubber part and a rim. And they're two separate entities, but the two of them together make a wheel. And if you have a tire that's gone and only a rim, it's not the proper functioning unit, right? So they're, they're two, but they're one. And they're so intricately tied to one another that the only thing that can 
divide asunder and separate them out is really the word of God. That's what the word of God says. Amen. Amen. Um, and I got to tell you that it's very difficult also to separate marrow from bone. Amen. Yeah. Um, we're not going to, I don't, I'm not necessarily trying to get into all that right now, but if you've ever seen a bone marrow aspiration, that's a very painful and a very difficult mm -hmm. thing. But nevertheless, it, the, the, the two of them are, create one unit. And for a few minutes, I want to describe our makeup as humans. I want you to try to understand a little bit better about yourself so that you can understand how God wants to work in you. Amen. Y'all cold this morning? Man, he's trying to take care of you. He's going to crank up the heat a little bit. Don't turn on the heater, please. All right. For a few minutes, I want to describe our makeup as humans. So I want to say it like this. So this is our spirit man right here. This is the spirit part of us. And I want you to know that we are spirits. I'm about to show you some, some scripture to try to describe what I'm talking about. But you are a spirit. Yes, you're in a body, but that body's going to die and decay. And yes, you will get a new one. And it's going to be a whole lot better. Praise God. Amen. But what I'm trying to tell you is, is that you ain't, a, you ain't a body. You're a spirit. That's the eternal nature of who you are. You're not going to die. That pneuma spirit, we'll get into that in a little bit more, is always going to exist. You, 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 have, you have a soul. And what I mean by that is this, is that, and I'm going to get into it a little bit deeper, but your soul is who you are. Your soul is what makes Naya Naya, Mama Mama, Travis Travis, Matt Matt. Our soul is our individuality. You know, whenever you get into all these teachings of New Age and Buddhism, and there was an old song back in, I don't know if it was the 70s, the spirit in the sky. We're all going to be part of the spirit in the sky. No, you're not. You're not going to. Whenever you're, you know, hey, listen, I read this awesome literature book one time called Jane Eyre, written by Charlotte Bronte. And she said, whither will that spirit flit when at length released? Where will, where will it flit? It's going to flit either to heaven with the Lord or it's going to flit to hell with the devil. And that's where that spirit is going to go when at length it is released. Because that spirit is going to live for an eternity. And guess what? Your soul means that you're an individual. You're still going to be mad when your spirit is flitted wherever it flits. And that's why you're going to know where it is flitted to. That's why you're going to know exactly where it is that you ended up. And you better hope that you had your faith in Jesus Christ. Did I say you better hope your life was perfect? I didn't say that. Did I say that you better hope that you never sinned again after you got saved? I didn't say that. You better hope that you put faith in Christ and what he did for you at the cross. And if you did that, and he has atoned for your sin and if he has taken the wrath of sin upon him in your stead hallelujah when you die the word of God says your spirit will flit and be released to the Lord amen, amen. so you are a spirit you have a soul and our inner man which is made up of our soul and our spirit is in this body amen does that make sense Spirits, again, have eternal natures. We are spiritual beings, and the spiritual aspect of our humanity will never die. Just talking a little bit about spiritual things, God is a spirit. Look at John chapter 4, verse 24. He created you and I in his image. Yes. John 4 and 24. This is when Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman, just to give you a reminder of an idea. Jesus says to her, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. Hey, what a beautiful plan that the God that we serve has is that he allowed his spiritual nature to become man, to be like us. Amen. So that we could see him, that the disciples who walked with him could give us a report of what they saw. I mean, even Peter you know, talks about it in one of his letters. He said, we handled the truth of life. You don't have to believe if you don't want to, buddy. We're eye, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, yes. Peter yes. said. Basically, he's saying, this isn't happening in some back alley somewhere. We're not telling you some fable that we heard and we're passing down. No, we were with him when he transformed upon the Mount of Transfiguration. When we saw his deity shine out of him and he became white like, a, like fuller soap had cleaned his clothing and the glory of God radiated out of him. We were with him on that mountain. We saw it. We're going to tell you about it. 
so that you can partake with us in this communication, this communion that we have with God. You can give your heart to him too, and you and I can all be part of the eternal family. But God is a spirit, and he told that Samaritan woman that those that are going to worship God, it don't matter what mountain you're on, it don't matter what church you're in, if you're going to worship God, you're going to worship him in spirit and in truth. I want to make a point to you. The spirit of man can also be dead to God. You got to understand that just because this, this broken down body one day is going to die and decay, that pneuma, that spirit is never going to die. Yes, it, the second death describes eternal death, but eternal death is separation from God. Mm -hmm. It's not what the Jehovah's Witnesses teach. They, they teach that your, soul, that your soul just goes to sleep. Mm -hmm. you, you, just go, you just go, oh, it's just so comfortable. Mm -hmm. Go to sleep. There's no hell. There's no hell to fear. No. As a matter of fact, I got in a conversation with, well, I'm not going to go off on all this, but I was talking for two weeks with one of their elders, and he's like, the last conversation I had with him was when he, he was the nicest thing until I said this. I said, sir, you're, you're over there teaching people that there's not a hell. I'm here to tell you that you're preaching a false Jesus. You're preaching a lying gospel. You're, you're, you're going to send people to a devil's hell that is a demonically inspired. Oh, Lord, you should have seen it come out of him then. And he's like, you're preaching demon spirit. I don't know, sir. I'm preaching a holy God that sent his son Jesus to die on the cross and that he is the only way to, to not go to where you're, you're denying that it even exists. I can't even remember the scripture, but I was looking at some stuff this morning. I think it might be Ecclesiastes 12, Ecclesiastes 12, which was Solomon. You know, one of the things they use a scripture out of Ecclesiastes to describe soul sleep because they talk about the rest of whatever in the earth. But then in the same book I was reading this morning, it talked about the fact that the body's going to go into the earth and the spirit's going to be released back to God. So there you go. In their same book that they're using, I got to remember to memorize that one. It might be Ecclesiastes 12, 7. I don't know because I want to make sure that the next time one of them comes, now they just send in letters. Okay, let me get off of this. <laughs> All right. God is a spirit. Amen. And those that are going to worship him are going to worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, I want you to know that other creations are spirits also, right? Again, humans are spirits. I know I've already explained that, but let's look at it. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 through 23. It says, you are coming to Mount Zion. Now, there's a mountain in Jerusalem called Zion. <laughs> this is talking about a heavenly Zion right here. You have come to the heavenly Zion, we could say, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. There you go. And to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. Can you imagine how beautiful that looks? We showed up over here this morning to have church. And guess what? He's talking about the church in glory. Hallelujah. This is where you showed up today, to the mountain of Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, an innumerable, can you imagine that worship service? And innumerable host of angels that were created to worship God and also to minister to the heirs of salvation. God created angels to worship him and to minister to you. If you weren't feeling special when you walked in here this morning, I'm here to tell you God created angels so that they could minister to you in your need. I don't know how it all works and I'm not trying to get so focused on angels that I forget about my Jesus and the Holy Ghost, but I will here, I am here to tell you that God created angels so that they could somehow, somehow way minister to you just like they ministered to Jesus when the Amen. enemy tried to tempt him Amen. in the wilderness. Hallelujah. Look at this. The general assembly and church of the firstborn which are written in heaven. Did you know if you're saved your name is written in the Lamb's book of life? And to the God, the judge of all and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Did you realize that when you gave your heart to Jesus something happened to your spirit on the inside. Your spirit man became justified and the switch, I wish I had somebody back there to flip the switch, but it's okay. And you, the switch was flipped. It was off, now it's on. Hallelujah. And whenever that happened, your spirit man, who you were was justified. And I've already taught it many a time, but that means declared righteous by God. I don't care what the devil tells you. I don't care what your mama tells you. If you have put your faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for you at the cross, the word of God teaches that God has declared you righteous. But hallelujah, when you go to this church service, your, your just spirit will have been made perfect. Oh, 
Oh, is that beautiful? Is that not the most beautiful thing? You ever try to spend some time in worship with the Lord? Even on your own time, right? You try to spend time in worship with the Lord. I'm going to wake up tomorrow morning. And I'm not even trying to do this as a work of the flesh. I'm going to wake up tomorrow morning. You know why? Because I know God is worthy. Amen. I'm going to put on some worship music. And I'm going to try to practice worshiping the Lord because He's worthy. Amen. And then all of a sudden, some stupid thought enters your head. Yeah. You start thinking, dude, I used to be plagued by that stupid dip I used to dip. Thank God He delivered me from that. Now, I, my mind was always thinking about, I know it's goofy dip, really, dude. I don't know, man. I just, and, you know, I'd be thinking about that or I'd be thinking about something else. And here is supposed to be time when I'm focused on the Lord. But one day your, your justified spirit, man, is going to be made perfect. Yes. You're not going to have a sinful nature anymore. Amen. You're going to have a glorified body. And God from you is going to be able to receive the worship. That he deserves. Amen? Amen. Angels are spirits. Look at Hebrews chapter 1 verses 13 through 14. It says right here, we taught this the other night. As a matter of fact, I just want to let y'all know, I'm going to reserve the right if I want to every now and then just to pop up on that little Facebook thing and to do a little teaching. But I'm not going to also, I'm also going to reserve the right to not pop up on Facebook. If I don't. <laughs> but so if I just decide to do a teaching, I'm going to tell Diane, okay, put a little word out there that we're going to, and so maybe even just to pray with all this crazy stuff going yeah, on, do like yeah. a little prayer and a little word or something like that. So just be looking out for it. I'll, give, I'll try to give you a little bit of time anyway. Yeah. Amen. I want you to see angels are spirits. Hebrews 1, 13 through 14. But to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? So if you watched the teaching the other night, the point that Hebrews 1 and chapter 2 are talking about is that Jesus, as the Son of God, the eternal Son of God, the eternal King, is superior to the angelic creation. Never did God ever tell uh, one of the angels to sit at his right hand until God would make their enemies his footstool. No, but to the Son, he did that. And what the angels are, they're ministering spirits sent forth to minister to you and I who would be heirs of salvation. Lastly, I just want to make a point. Demons are spirits. Okay? Look at Luke chapter 11, verse 24. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walks through dry places seeking rest and finding none. He says, I will return into my house whence I came out. Now, this is not really part of my message here. I'm going to be honest with you. But all of these entities except for God, other than God in Christ, we don't know what God looks like, God the Father, right? We don't know if he has a form or, or uh, image because no man has ever seen him. The closest one would be Moses. And really he only allowed Moses to see his hinder cord because, you know, no man can look into the face of God. But anyway, nevertheless, we know that God became man and so he had a physical body. We know that angels in some way have bodies. We don't know exactly what they look like. It's some kind of fourth dimensional coalescence of atoms that come together in some way. Because Paul said in Hebrews 13 that when you entertain strangers, be careful for some have entertained angels unaware. So I do know that angels can morph into this image of a human being. Do what you want with that. That's what the Word of God says. I choose to believe it. Amen. 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 And also, it seems to me, people can say whatever they want, believe whatever scholar or commentator you want, but it seems like to me, Satan transmorphed himself into the image of a serpent in the garden. Amen. So, nevertheless, what I'm trying to tell you is, is that angels can play around with their physical image. But the point is, they're all spirits. And I believe that demon spirits actually come from the Nephilim of old. Right. When Goliath was killed, that spirit was released. Mm. Those spirits where they're supposed to be is in the pit. We don't I don't want to get in all this right now, but people can conjure them up. Mm. And there are spirits that go around wreaking havoc. Demon spirits upon the earth, fallen angels upon the earth, wreaking havoc in people's lives. But the Holy Ghost wants to live in you and give you strength and victory and power. Over all of that. That's one of the things that you need to understand is that, listen, psychology will lie to you when it comes to things like addiction and all these other things. They'll turn everything into an addiction. I just can't get free from, from wanting to 
you know, to touch another woman or to touch another man. I must have a sexual addiction. No, you got it. It's called a sin and it's called a sin called lust. And the right prescription for that, brothers and sisters, is to put your faith in Jesus Christ. And you can do that with any type of addiction. Listen, if there's an addiction connected to it, you don't have to have a scripture that says thou shalt not smoke, thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not gamble. You don't need all that. I'm telling you right now, if there's a, if there's a, an addiction Addiction connected to the point where you will have be a millionaire one day and two weeks later you ain't got nothing left because you done gambled it all away or you done, done did all you done squandered it all away to the point where you ain't got nothing left. That means there's demon spirits behind that right, that's right. driving you to that. I'm here to tell you, Jesus has set you free. You got to learn to believe that and you got to start putting your trust in that. And the enemy wants to destroy your faith against that. But I'm here to tell you that if you'll stand strong and keep believing, even when you don't see it as quickly as you want to, God will make it happen in your life. Amen. So those demon spirits come out of these Nephilim. But the main point I'm trying to talk to you about this morning, and I know I'm going a long way about it, is that we got spirit. We are a spirit. We have a soul. The eternal residing place for spiritual creatures will be either in the presence of God or separated from the presence of God. Matthew 25, 41. This is Jesus talking about the kingdom to come. He had talked about the parable of the talents. Then he talks about the goats and the sheep and that one day he's going to divide them up. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. You know, God's intent when he made hell was never for human beings to go there. It was for the devil and his angels. Look at Revelation 20, 13 through 15. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. Talking about the physically dead. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And all those, we're talking about the second death. We're talking about the great white throne judgment right here. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever, talking about people, was not found written in the book of life, was cast into the lake of fire. So the, so the devil and his angels in the lake of fire. The, fa the beast, which is the antichrist and the false prophet in the lake of fire. And every human being that's name was not written in the Lamb's book of life into the lake of fire. The second death is the fact that the spirits of humans who are not saved will be consigned to eternal punishment in the lake of fire with the devil and his angels and the antichrist and false prophets. So again, we are spirits. We have a soul. Our soul is what makes us individuals. I am Matt Bear, and you are who you are. Look at this word soul in the Greek. I just want you to know that if you were going to write it out, I'm not going to write it in Greek just because I, I'm going to lose. It's not important. But if you were gonna, you you were gonna write it in the way it sounds in Greek, this is what you would have. So just let's just do this. Boop. All right. See how easy that was. Yeah. It's where we get the word psyche. It's where we get the word psychology. It's where we get the word mind. So part of your soul has to do with your mind. But what else, what else can we say? I'm not trying to, that's just where the word psychology came from. I'm not over here trying to promote psychology. I'm just trying to tell you right. psychology is the science of the mind. Yeah. And what I'm trying to tell you is that part of your soul is very interconnected with your mind. It's also interconnected with your emotions. Right. Do we not agree that really, whether we agree with it or not, and I don't agree with it, really the majority of psychology, but they're trying to deal with people's mind and people's emotions, right? So you have a soul, you have a suke, you have a psyche. This word involves the mind, the feelings, desires, affections, our heart, our soul. Our spirit life, again, is from God. The word is pneuma breath, but long after our breathing stops, the pneuma spirit keeps living or keeps dying, depending on whether you were saved. The spirit is either alive or dead to God, depending on whether it was born once or twice. If you have not been born again, then your spirit that's in you, your spirit, is not alive to God's spirit. But once you get born again, the switch flips and your spirit becomes alive to God. Let's look at it. Ezekiel 36 Verses 26 through 27. This is talking about the new covenant. In the Old Testament, this is about 
I'm, I'm taking a guess here, about 600 AD, I mean 600 BC, all right? And, and God spoke to the prophet Ezekiel, might be a little older than that, 650, 700, somewhere around that, between 5 and 700 BC. And God showed Ezekiel that there was a new covenant coming. And he's talking about Jesus. What's going to happen when Jesus gets here? This is what he said. When Jesus gets here and we're in the new covenant, I'm going to give you a new heart. Are we are there yet? Ezekiel 36. 26 through 27. The people on the computer have it. All you Facebook people out there, you got it faster than we did. A new heart also will I give you. A new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. <clears throat> so what I want you to see about this scripture, what it's saying is, is that in the new covenant, when you put your faith in Christ, God did something to your spirit. Yeah. He caused your spirit to come alive. I'm going to put a new spirit in you. But not only that, I'm going to put my spirit in you. Amen? So when you get saved, the spirit, the eternal part of who you are, comes alive to God. Now look at 1 Corinthians 2.14, because the person that's not saved is dead to the things of God. It says that the natural man, what does that mean? The fleshly man, the physical man, the one that is separate from God, the one that's not awakened to God. You want to talk about needing to be woke? That's what everybody's talking about now. I don't even know exactly what it means. They'd be like, oh, this silly man over here trying to use the word woke and he don't even know what it means. Well, I know one thing. You either woke to God or you dead to God. And the only thing I need to be woke to is to the truth Amen. of God. That's what I need to be woke to. Because if I'm woke to that, guess what? I'm going to treat people right. I'm going to be led by the Holy Ghost and I'm going to treat people right. And it don't matter what the color of their skin is because we all created in the image and likeness of God. That's what you need to be woke to. You need to be woken and awakened to the things of God. Hallelujah. And let the love of God have its way in your heart. Amen. Praise God. Amen. He says, look at, but he says, the, but the natural man, he's not woke. And he can't receive the things of the Spirit of God. That, see, that's a mess. You can sit here and try to get social justice for people on this earth. And the reality of it is you ain't helped nobody because your motives were impure to That's begin it. with. And yeah. you were so focused on all this earthly stuff. And it was all a deception. And it was all a lie to try to pull you away from the one important thing that you were supposed to have. And it was an understanding and a revelation of the God of glory so that the Spirit of God could reveal the things of God to yeah. you. But instead, you got caught up in another plan, another Diversion from the enemy. See, but to the natural mind, the things of God are foolishness to him because he can't know them. You know why? Because they're spiritually discerned. Right. right. <laughs> In order for you to have an understanding of spiritual things, you're going to have to be born again to God. So again, my main emphasis today is the soul. All right, but I've tried to make it a point about the difference between the two. My main emphasis today is the soul. It's who we are, but it's also who we've become. Life experiences, just bear with me here, life experiences mold our thoughts and make us the person that we are. I'm about to break it down for you, but just think about this. I want you to think this morning. Life experiences affect who we are. The relationships that we have. I mean, do we have to go through this and take all this time to think about that? Think about it. Think about the different relationships that you've had. Yeah. Some, you know, listen... Some ladies in here, you might have had multiple boyfriends, and the only reason I'm trying to say that is is that one boyfriend might have been nicer than the other boyfriend. One boyfriend might have been verbally abusive. One boyfriend might have been physically abusive. One boyfriend, you might look back and say, man, he didn't know God, but he was actually kind of sweet. You, you understand what I'm saying? All I'm trying to say is, is that these relate or friendships. I had friends back in Lafayette one time, you know, I, but I was a little bit of a mess. And, and one time, man, my friends, I kept, and I always hung out with people that were tougher than me. I don't know if that was smart or dumb, because one night I was running my mouth to a group of these, these guys, and they were all, they could all beat me up one by one. But guess what? I was still running my mouth, because I'm like, yeah, I'm fat, mad, the river rat, I tell you. And look, they all jumped on me. They were all older than me. We were at a rodeo, and we were back there where the lifestyle was. They took all my clothes off, and they threw them on the other side of the thing, and now I'm running around. 
not trying to get my clothes. They're like, we're going to teach you something, boy. I don't even know what my point was. Okay? But you know what that did for me? That was an experience in life through relationships that kind of, you know what it did? It kind of made, it kind of woke me to the fact that I was a little too sassy. Right, right. I'm not saying it fixed the problem all right in there, but at least made me realize, man, you gotta watch what you say around these boys. You me run around this old rodeo naked if you don't want to. Right? I, that's what I'm trying to say, though. That's a funny story, but at the same time, think about it. Relationships right. affect us, and then even from a young age. Can you remember things that took place when you were a young child? Even simple yeah. things like when somebody clowned your clothes, yeah. right? They made fun of your clothes. I wish we weren't so weak. I wish we weren't so gullible, but we are. Sometimes like, like things wound us and we yeah. carry it. You know, and they, they called you names and they made fun of you. And it wounds you. And this is all part of your psyche, your suke, your soul, your emotions. And you're being molded by the world. The enemy is trying to destroy you ultimately. Yeah. The way our parents raised us. Good, bad, pain, joy, right? The decisions that we made. Drugs, alcohol, yeah. relationships. People, those are decisions that we made. Your mama, mama and daddy try to tell you, you know, you good, uh, what does it say, bad company corrupts good morals. Mm -hmm. Everybody, try, you better watch out who you hang out with, boy. Yeah. I didn't live, yeah, whatever. <laughs> You're in one ear and out the next. Mm -hmm. Start hanging around with people that smoke a little weed. Next thing you know, go, oh, Lord, what are you doing now five years later? Amen. Dropping acid and getting arrested. You know, I mean, I'm just saying that for me, that's what it was. I'm not ashamed to tell you. I'm ashamed of the past, but I'm grateful for the future. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Drugs, alcohol, relationships, people that we became friends with, enemies, negative life circumstances. Things happen that affect who we are. People that we love die. There's death and dying upon this earth. Body image issues, right? The, the, when people made fun of us, you know, and then like just like the devil that you know somebody could be beautiful, and I'm telling you right now, you could see the one flaw immediately. I mean, if you're anything like the way I used to be, anyway, like you could see the one flaw, boom, and you focus in on that. And the devil will use you as a vessel Amen. to focus on that. The music we choose to listen to. Think about it. Yeah, I know that people don't like it when I start talking about their music. They want pet. Oh, it's a little pet. I love my music, man. Leave my music alone. But I'm just trying to make a point. All these things are working together to influence who we are as individuals. Yeah. It's affecting us. That's it. It's affecting that inner man. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the things we listen to that we experience from life affect our psyche and play a role in molding us into who we are, or shall I say, they try to mold us into who this world wants us to be. The world wants us to be a certain... The, the enemy, listen, I don't mean to get too technical, and I don't know if I know for sure, I think it's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, where it talks about the prince of the power of the air. And the spirit that works in the children of disobedience. And that it's leading them. We all used to be part of it. The course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. So there's a certain course that the world. Under the influence of the devil. Is trying to herd everybody in a direction. And trying to mess them up. Right. Right. And he'll use anything he can. He'll use your old boyfriend. He'll use your old friend. He'll use the music industry. He'll use drugs and alcohol. He'll use improper parenting techniques. And even no matter what, how good a parent tries, it ain't all the parents' fault. Because at some point in time, we got to grow up and take responsibility for ourselves. Amen. You know, there was some truth when I was in my first rehab. They wanted a letter written that described probably the reason why I was the way I was. It was a letter that talked about my dad. And there was a lot of truth in that letter. Finally, they wanted me to read it because they thought it was the right thing to do. I mean, some of those things, you know, maybe I had suppressed and I didn't remember. But most of it I knew. But you know what the Lord showed me as I became? He said, 
when I was a child, I did childish things, but when I became a man, hallelujah. You, when, when, that's one thing that whenever you allow the Lord to have his way in your heart and life, he wants you to become a woman of God, he wants you to become a man of God, and he wants us to own up to our own responsibilities and to quit blaming everybody else for the plight or the condition that we're in. Yes, yes, daddy did some things wrong, but guess what? His daddy did some things wrong to him, and it ain't all daddy's fault. And if I keep blaming daddy, and I don't stand up and recognize that I got my own self to blame, then the Lord can't begin to heal me. Amen. We're talking about the soul, the suke. We're talking about the individual of who you are and how the world that you've lived in has affected you. Our soul experiences the world we live in. Yeah, he's, on, wait, he's in there. But it's our soul that is experiencing the world we live in. Does that make sense? The music that we listen to is getting down deeper. The relationships are having a deeper effect. I mean, look, I'm, I'm not trying to get weird on you, but I'm just trying to get the point across. A man that's abusive to a woman, he slaps her in the face. Yeah, she's got a physical mark on her face, but what about the, the, the pain the pain and the turmoil that just took place on the inside? The scar that happened on the inside. That's what I'm trying to get at. That individual that's being affected by all of these things. And, and, and our soul experiences the world we live in, but guess what? We engage it through our physical body that our soul lives in. We engage this world in a godly way once we're saved and use our body to serve God. Or we can choose instead to still serve our fleshly desires and not submit to the ways of God. But don't wonder why you're a grown up in the Lord still acting like a baby on a bottle. Come on. It's because you're allowing your fleshly members to engage your world in an ungodly way and feed your soul the ways of the world. And you're not growing in Christ. You're instead following the leader known as flesh. Oh, I don't like the preacher. I don't like that church. The people in the church aren't cool. No, you ain't cool, boo. The problem is, is that you so focused on all your little thing you got one to have going on. You want everything just right. No, it's God's will. It's God's way. It's God's word. And he's not going to bow down to none of us. Instead, he's just asking somebody to tell the truth. Somebody surrender to the truth. And I can work with that. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. So we don't want to follow the leader of the flesh. But when we do that, look at Romans chapter 6, verses 12 through 13. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 6, 12 through 13, he says, don't let the sinful nature reign in your physical body. That's basically what he's saying. That you would obey it in the lust thereof. Also, don't yield. What does a yield sign do? It gives somebody else the right of way, right? You come to the yield sign, they're coming up on the traffic. You, you pump your brakes so that they can go first. When you yield your members, your body parts, to the sinful nature, what it's saying is, is that you're, get, you're, you're, you're given permission for the sinful nature to lead you, to get in front of you so that you, now you're following them. And, and your members are your hands. I always like to just make it real for you, right? Yeah. Whenever you use your hand to bring something to ingest it into your body. I mean, I'm thinking of chemical things that are doing us harm, bad things. I use my hands to bring things and use my mouth to ingest it. And it gets on the inside, however that looks. I use my eyes to look upon things and I'm bringing it in. The eye is the window to the soul. I'm bringing it in. I use my ears to allow things to come in that are going to influence me. All this stuff is coming in. I'm using my members. And, and you know you know what the word is? So, and instruments of unrighteousness. You know what the word instrument means in the Greek? Literally, a weapon of warfare. The enemy is like turning, flipping the script and you're using your own body parts as a weapon of warfare against yourself. Yeah. Yes, God, the enemy will use your, your members, your body parts as weapons of warfare to go against other people. He'll use your mouth to cut other people down, to dog them, to gossip behind their back. He, he will use your hands, he will use, you know, whatever to steal from them, to, to, to try to destroy them, to deceive them. But at the same time, he's flipping it back on you because when you're doing that, you're destroying yourself. But instead, yield yourselves unto God. Let God have the right of way. Amen? By the grace of God, once you're a Christian, the grace of God flowing in you can give you the strength that you need to let God 
have his way and to get out in front and to lead you. Amen? Amen. Why would you do that? Yield yourselves to God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. So we're eternal spirits. We have a soul. Our soul is affected either positively by God or negatively by this fallen world and the forces of evil. The game changer is when we get saved. Amen? Because before we are saved, our spirit man is dead to the things of God. But once we are saved, our spirits become alive to God. And after all that, that I just did, this is the main point that I want to make. God has given us a free will. And he desires that we will willingly exercise our free will in a direction that brings us closer to him and further away from the world and the enemy. But there is a battle taking place where our flesh wants to go in a direction of what self wants and the Holy Spirit is trying to promote us to go in a direction that God wants. Amen? This involves every aspect of our lives, not just the easy things like we talked about earlier and, you know, the drunk and the lust and the sin and the lying and the cheating and the stealing. No, the very essence of every decision that you make on this earth involves a battle between your will, the flesh, and the will of God, which is the Spirit of God. This is why the Word of God is so important because the Word of God, with the help of the Holy Spirit, teaches you the culture of God. I don't think that I can make that point enough. The culture of God. Imagine that. We talk about cultures on the earth. And, and the fact that certain cultural people, groups, do things differently in various ways. I'm here to tell you that the only culture that matters is the culture of God. Amen. And you don't learn that necessarily in a living room. Yeah, you might learn it in a living room if they're cracking this book open. But this is the culture of God in here. This word will teach you the ways of God. And this book right here is in opposition to this current world system that we're living upon. Then when, as the culture of God is placed on the inside of you with the help of God, the Holy Spirit teaches you the will of God. Look at Ephesians 4, 23 through 24. We're about to close. It says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now listen to me. Yes. Until you start opening up the book and start reading some pages, you'll never expose yourself to the Word of God in a way where it can have an effect in your life. But when we're talking about the renewing, renewing of the mind and its connection to the Word, it's just not about reading, like doing... How do I describe this? It's not just about you doing, like reading the Word of God like a rule. Does that make sense? Well, they told me that I need to read at least one chapter a day. <clears throat> and if you're doing that to try to earn some kind of favor with God or to just do your checklist, you're missing the point. The whole point to reading the Word of God is so that we'll begin to understand the Word of God so that through the Word of God and the Holy Spirit, again, He can renew our mind from this fallen world's way of thinking <laughs> To the new way of thinking, which is God's will. See, you were born of Adam with a sinful nature, and then all those life experiences continued to add to that fallen nature to where you were so far away from God and that that's all you've learned from your past. Now when you get saved, God wants to start bringing you into his word and his culture and his Amen. kingdom that's on this earth. One day you and I are going to live with him forever. Amen. And we're not going to have all that mess that we've had down here. He's not allowing that stuff up there. He kicks that stuff out. Yeah. That's what happened whenever Satan tried. Right? But be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man. You know you're a new man if you're saved? Yes. There's a new man in you? Yes. He put a new spirit in you. He put his spirit on the inside of you. Amen? And he wants to slowly change that soul in you. Amen? Amen? which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. This is my last scripture. Be not conformed to this world. Amen. That word conformed literally means to be molded from the outside like a potter with clay. All those things that we talked about before, relationships, parenting, music, whatever, decisions that we made, all that stuff has been like a bunch of hands of, the pot, of different potters 
Oh man, that's that could preach all by itself, right? A bunch of different hands on that clay that's spinning upon the earth, and they all got their own idea of what they want you to look like. Lord, that thing's gonna come out looking like Frankenstein, <laughs> right? But if you would just, if we would just learn to trust our lives in the hands of the Potter. Amen. He would produce a vessel that's worthy to be used by him. But don't be molded by this world. Instead, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That word right there, transform, I didn't plan on really preaching this, but I've done it many times before. I already talked earlier about the transfiguration of Jesus. You remember when I said that earlier? That word right there is the same word used in that text. And you know what the word is? It's metamorphio. And it's where we get the word metamorphosis. And I always think of the butterfly when I think of that. Because a butterfly used to be a worm, a caterpillar. But then it was put into a cocoon, which is kind of like a tomb. And then next thing you know, it resurrects and it's got new life. It's, got, it's, it's, be, it's no longer a ground dweller. Hallelujah. It's, a, it's seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And what I'm trying to say is, is that when you get saved, now the DNA of God, hallelujah, is on the inside of you. And that which is in you... Is supposed to shine out of you. When Jesus transfigured on the Mount of Olives, what was in him, deity, came out of him. When you and I are walking upon this earth, what's in us is supposed to come out of us. What's in you? Jesus. Yeah, I know there's a bunch of other garbage, but that's not what God wants coming out. God wants Jesus coming out. So the more Jesus that we're putting in there, the more Jesus that we're allowing to grow on the inside of us, hopefully the more Jesus... That would start coming out of us. So don't let this world mold you, but instead let the Spirit of God in you transfigure you. Hallelujah. By the renewing of your mind. Listen, if you start learning the culture of God, you're going to be able to pick it out real easy. That ain't God. You might still go that way, but you're going to know that ain't God. And if you keep going in that direction, brothers and sisters, I got to tell you, that your conscience can become seared. Your heart can become hard. It becomes harder and harder to turn. Right? I'm just thinking right now, you know, we're trying we're talking about going in a direction. I don't have I haven't driven a truck like that in a while or a car like that in a while, but some of them ain't got power steering. And I mean I, I'm over there trying to put my whole body into it. It becomes harder and harder to turn in the right direction the longer we go in the wrong direction. Listen, I'm I'm close, I promise. The mind is molded more towards the things of God as we learn of God. And this allows us to make godly decisions. This allows us to be led by the Spirit in everyday life situations. Are we going to follow the Spirit or are we going to follow the flesh? Because listen, sometimes we, sometimes we don't even know our own selves. Right. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? The Apostle Paul said that. He said, I'm, not, I don't, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, I'm not needing to answer to any of y'all. But because I don't see anything wrong. But just because I don't see anything wrong doesn't mean that I'm right before God. He said, one day I'm going to be there and the Lord's going to let me know whether I was right or wrong. Because sometimes we can think we got it all figured out. We're right. Now listen, if the Apostle Paul has to say that about himself, you and I better realize, we better learn by the grace of God to realize that we might not always be right. That we might be wrong also. Amen? So listen, these daily decisions, jobs. How many times, but I don't want to work here anymore. I don't want to work here anymore. I don't like the way old boy treats me. But guess what? God might be using old boy in your life to do something in you, my friend. Because you might be thinking that you're more than what you ought to be. Come on. The word of God says don't think more highly of yourself than what you are. God knows how to use stuff. Yeah. Don't put it past him. The word of God is clear. He will chastise those whom he loves. You over there praying in your closet, Lord, make me look more like Jesus. Whoa-oh. <laughs> did you see what they did to my son? Yeah. Whoa-oh. Are you ready? Because they, they didn't treat him right. And you ain't going to always be treated right. And let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. When you can start going through life, and sometimes things not going your way at work, people talking about you, people doing stuff. Listen, I'm going to say it on the camera. I'm just going to go ahead and do it. It is what it is. And I mean, I'm just going to share with you. Look, my part of the clinic one time, we won a national award. They wanted to fly one of us over there. Most of my doctors, and if you happen to be watching, this is what it is. This is the truth. Most of my doctors hate taking my place. 
One of the doctors was like, well, we ought to fly Matt over there because he's the one that is his part of the clinic. He'd been doing this for 20 some years. The one that hated taking my place the most decided, oh, I would like to go receive that award. So he flew to Minnesota and picked up the award. Point being is this, I walked around in it for about two days, but then I had to get over myself. Right, right. It's just a little piece of glass sitting on a desk. Right. But was I frustrated? Yeah, my flesh was like, dude, you don't even want to take my spot. You don't do nothing but complain every time that. Oh, yeah, that's what I think. That's what I know. I've heard it. Okay, but guess what? God will use those things. Oh, yeah. I'm, like, what do do? I'm not playing in this sandbox anymore. I'm going to grab my toys and get up and go. They're not treating me right. Yeah, okay, dummy, you do that. They've been treating you right. They have been. They've been treating me right. Yeah, he went and got the award, but other than that, guess what? I could care less about that piece of glass. Amen. Amen. Put the check in the bank account and let me do my job, right? Come on, that's what I'm there for. I ain't there for a crawfish, boy. I'm just saying, I'll give you my time. I want to get compensated. I'm done, right? So I pay my tithes to the church. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Do for the kingdom of God. Anyway, jobs. God wants you to make the right decisions with your job. Whenever you want to just drag up and leave, God will, if that God's not done with you there, he will reveal it to your heart. But if your flesh is in the way and you're like, oh, no, I'm about to get paid. Guess what? I told myself that one time. I'm about to get paid. I'm about to leave this job over here and I'm going to Dotree Hospital. In one year, that whole clinic was closed down that I was about to leave to go to. Wow. God dealt with me, dealt with me, dealt with me. I'm just saying, be led by the Holy Ghost. Relationships. Yeah. Oh, Lord, help us. Women, if you're single. Men, if you're single. Relationships. Just because somebody posts a scripture on their Facebook page, just because they send you a scripture through the text message, don't mean that they're a woman or a man of God. And if you, come on, help me out now. If you haven't gotten free from the spirit of lust and you think getting married is going to free you from the spirit of lust, you now have bought a lie. Because you could have sex a million times with the person that you married and still be bound by a spirit of lust. Cause come on, help me out. That ain't going to free you from the spirit of lust. Amen. You need to let God do a work in your heart and you need to allow the Holy Ghost to lead you and guide you. And people are like, oh, that preacher's a little too much. He tells grown adults not to be kissing and making out. If you ain't married and you start, Amen. listen to me, you start making out and you start getting all heated and hot, now you done invited something else into this relationship, my friend. You just do it however you want, though, because you've grown up and you know. And, and Pastor Matt don't know nothing about that. Pastor Matt don't know nothing about kissing girls when he wasn't supposed to kiss girls. No, listen to me. Whenever you open up a door to things, you allow something else to come in. It starts to influence you and now next thing you know you're about to make decisions and ain't make no sense you following your flesh because but this is what I want okay okay this is what you want your free will wants this okay go get you some see where you end up God is not mocked whatever a man soweth that shall he also reap if a man sows to his flesh he will reap a harvest of flesh yes yes Help us, Lord. How will I respond? Mm. That's good. I always used to like it whenever Robert used to say that. Well, can you go back and tell her about your Jesus? Mm. And go to the, go to the last night. There you go. I, I was, man, dude, I was tired. I was wore out. I'm hungry, though. And, and they, I don't feel like cooking the eggs. So I, I, I said, I, I thought enough about my mother-in-law and, and Isabella. I said, hey, y'all want some of them so what I want, I wanted some food. I ain't going to lie to you. I probably ate too much. But I ordered steak quesadillas, two cheese enchiladas a la carte with a side of rice. I wanted that rice up in that enchilada sauce. You hear me? I get back to the house, they ain't got no side of rice. So what do I do? I do. As bad as I wanted that rice, I was too tired to drive back over there and get it. And I was too tired to call him up and fuss at him. But the question is, is had I acted the fool? Right. right had I walked right. up in there with my mask on and said, hey, hey, y'all forgot my rice. And then carried on. 
How does that look? See, I'm just trying to say, am I going to follow my flesh? Dude, I'm tired. I'm hungry. I paid you money. I want my wife. I want my day in court. You're about to pay. You're about to give me what I deserve. You know? And don't get me wrong. You got a right to get what you deserve if you pay for it. But there's a right way to get it in the wrong way. Amen. How will we respond? Will we be led by the flesh or will we be led by the spirit? Because God wants us to be humble. Yeah. Jesus was humble. Right. Amen. Yeah. Except for when the time was right. Then he was very bold. Amen. Yeah. Praise God. All right. Jobs, relationships. How will I respond? Purchases. I go back to that because sometimes I still struggle. <laughs> You know, Danielle likes fussing at me. I'm like, hey, look, I went and bought this and this. She said, how much money you spent today? I'm not going to lie to you. I'm just going to tell you straight up. The other day, I spent like $500 like, like that. How you did that? Because I went and bought some bullets and I bought some buckle jeans. I did it. I had one pair of buckle jeans left. I had one pair of jeans. And now I'm turn them into work jeans because it's getting cold. I went and bought me two pair of jeans and I bought me some bullets. I bought a bag of bullets. And I said, guess what? I'm waiting for my money. Woman. Buy me some bullets and some buckle jeans. But then I'm like, okay, but I need you to squirrel 2,000 away. And she's like, dude, you ain't got 2,000 to squirrel away. You got 1750 after you done spit your money. Okay, well, just squirrel that away for me then. <laughs> Purchases. And where I go to church. That's the last one, and we're closing with this, where I go to church. But I don't want to go to that church because he always telling the truth. I feel like he's stepping on my toes and he's poking me in the eye. And I don't I want I want you to tell me something that I want to hear. Oh, give me some, tickle my ears. Give me pleasant words, preacher. I want pleasant words. No, that's not what we do. Right. We, we read the word of God. We find out what yes. it says and we present yes. it to the people. And guess what? The one who gets it first is the preacher. And he's got a free will.